Okay, hi everybody, this is Gary Wilson, and welcome to tonight's live webinar for the Investor Agent Program. And again, as usual, we will likely have some people on who are, are, are or have gone through the program on learning how to do flips and or learning how to buy rentals. Uh, not a requirement. Those are actually obviously extracurricular activities, but it's but everybody on here has entered into the the Path of Profit platform by one of those venues. Most of you have been coming through the Investor Agent platform. In fact, ninety probably ninety five to ninety eight percent of you, because up until this past week, that's all I've taught in the last year. I haven't taught people how to buy flips and how to buy rentals specifically for over a year now because I've been devoting all my time to this project which is the investor agent program and for good reason we're getting some tremendous results we've got over 250 students and uh, we just did a review recently so you may have received a, an anonymous call and the reviews are pretty pretty uh, pretty nice actually very very refreshing in fact I'm, I'm flattered from what the, some of the results that I've seen so in any case uh, moving on here I want to go back and review a question from Marina up in um, Boston and she asked you know how can I get a 20% down payment on an investment property or a lender who will let me do that versus 25% because a lot of them are asking for 25% and the answer was Look for smaller banks, particularly commercial banks, regional or sub-regional banks who will make conventional loans. In other words, uh, they're not making loans that are that are uh, have strict uh, underwriting guidelines. Um, a lot of these smaller banks, by the way, are what, called, are what are called portfolio lenders, which means they keep their loans. They service them themselves. They don't sell those loans. See, the larger big box banks will often always sell those loans on a secondary market. So they've got a They've got to, to follow a lot uh, more stringent set of rules. I found it much, much easier to work with the smaller smaller banks, just way, way easier, okay? Um, let's see here. Another question is also where can you find an expensive kitchen cabinet refacing? I asked a couple, and it is very expensive. Thank you. Um, this is Marina. Hi, Marina. Um, it what you want to do, Marina, is go ahead and join your local investors club. Join, look for REIA, R-E-I-A, Real Estate Investors of America. Um, they've pretty much taken over the landscape coast to coast when it comes to investor clubs. And these are paid clubs. This is ones you have to pay for. This isn't one, you're not joining these clubs to get clients. Okay, you don't do that. You're, those guys will drive you crazy. However, it is a great resource for contractors, for plumbers, electricians, cabinetry men, Roofers, you know, carpenters, you name it, concrete people, clean out crews, because you can get a lot of uh, um, good references from other investors who have used them. It's, it's an excellent source of contractors. So join your local club. Matter of fact, Marina, you can often go free for the first time and look for all the tables around the around the outsides of the uh, the hallways. Those are your vendors, and look for the contractors and ask them what would they charge to pull off door and drawer fronts and refinish them, basically, you know, scrape them, sand them, paint them, whatever, you know, restain them and see what they would charge. Um, I've, often had, I've often had a lot of luck, you know, just finding regular handyman, a handyman who can do that stuff. He can take them off and take them to his home and his garage, do them at home and save a ton of money, save a bundle of money. So when you're at those investor clubs, Look for look for handyman services and look for independent independent individual guys. Okay, you can also put an ad out on a Craigslist or um, you know you could put one in the penny saver and just tell people what you're you don't you, what you're looking for is a handyman somebody who who will charge you by the hour. I don't usually advocate that, but for something like this, you can say, look, I'll give you you know you know 15 bucks an hour, or I'll give you you know, twenty dollars per door or drawer front, something like that, and I guarantee you'll get some takers. Um, you don't go to the big contractors, and definitely when you do, go to the contractors, get them from the investor clubs. Okay. Uh, and Lou was saying we'll do. Okay, Lou. So let's definitely see if we can squeeze you in tonight. If not, we'll talk later. Um, and Michael is saying, have you heard of Gold Star Referral Clubs? Um, I have not heard of them, Michael, but for everybody on the webinar here, write that down, Gold, Gold Star Referral Clubs. And uh, for you, for Marina up in Boston, I would check them out. Um, also, uh, 
yeah, they're all they have meetup groups. That's right, they're all over Meetup. Um, so you can go to Meetup.com and, and search them and find them in your area. And uh, let's see, there was something else I was going to say here, and I just lost my train of thought. Oh, I know what it was. Uh, uh, Angie's List. Check out Angie's List. That's another one. Okay. Um, so you can also check out your uh, every every city should also have an apartment association. It's an, an association of apartment managers, not necessarily owners, although a lot of owners belong to those associations. So it's just like your realtors association, but it's, it's specifically for property managers, and they often will share with you some of the guys that they've worked with who they really appreciate. So that's another, that's a third possible source for you, uh, Marina. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. We're at 712, and we just covered a few uh, questions right off the gate here. But what I want to do tonight, guys, and for those of you who are new to this, um, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go over the third part of a, of a three-part series teaching the students how to set up their own classroom format. So let me just preface this a little bit. What it's based on is the same concept of having an investor workshop or an investor forum, okay? And we've gone over that a number of times. Um, as a matter of fact, it's one of the techniques I go over in the free classes in the market centers. So everybody should have a pretty good idea of the basic concept of an investor workshop, which is your own workshop, not an investor club. This is your own workshop that you 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 invite your people to um, and that's a lot of it a lot of it's based on referral you just have a handful of people show up in the beginning people who you know for example and they spread the word and other people show up that's traditional uh, investor agent workshop and uh, again we, we only you only get up there and speak for five minutes and you turn it over to your consumers who would speak amongst themselves in roundtable discussions centered around the subjects of one table being for flips, one table being for rentals, et cetera, et cetera. So you should all be familiar with that. If anybody is not familiar with that, please, please let me know, and we'll devote another one of these webinars just to that workshop. It's that important, okay? But assuming you guys have all at least heard about it or have, have you know, remember us discussing it, what I want to do is cover an advanced version of that tonight. It's the third part of a three-part series. And the advanced version is take that same basic format, but turn it into a classroom setting, okay? And if you remember, two weeks ago, the first class you're going to do, it's a four-part series, three in the classroom, one out in the field. The first part is the part where you go over flips. And the reason I always like to do flips first is because flipping is an easier concept to teach and grasp, okay? There's, uh, there's basically only one mathematical formula. It's, it's the, the maximum allowable offer formula, okay? And it's an easy formula. It's basically your after repair value minus your profit and, and overhead for, for you know, carrying costs like commissions, for example, which is going to be 30%. And out of that result, you subtract your cost of your remodeling, okay? And that remaining number is your maximum allowable offer, all right? So it's as simple as that. Now, the physical analysis of a flip property is more complex, or sorry, more involved, not more complex, more involved than the physical analysis on a rental. Because on rentals, we tend to be a little bit more lenient on things like cabinetry and so forth, okay? Uh, not so in flips. So in flips, um, you actually will go through examples in your flip class, bring in, bring in listings and other possible sources of inventory. And again, you will have pre previewed them yourself first, and you hand out the analysis forms and the physical analysis spreadsheets and have them fill them in based on your input. You want them to get in the practice of doing that themselves. So that's the first class. The second class is we do essentially the same thing, but on rentals. So the first class would be the first week of the month. The second class would, and that's on flips, the second class would be on rentals, and that will be the second week of the month. And again, you invite the same people back. You tell them it's a four-part series. In the second class, you give them the calculators and also the same physical analysis form um, for f doing the physical analysis on rentals. But the, the, the financial analysis forms are more involved on rentals because there's more to it. You've got rental income. You've got a, a variety of expenses. You've got potential loans that have to be um, accounted for, the debt service, okay? Um, and again, you give examples of rental properties. That's the second one. Now, tonight what we're going to go over is the third class 
it would be the third week of the month, assuming you did this on a monthly series, um, you do, you know, your first week is flips, second week rentals, third week is wholesaling. We're, we're going to cover wholesaling tonight. So I'm going to review the methodology of wholesaling as an investment strategy. We're going to do that first, and then we're going to apply it in the classroom, okay? And then we'll do a review. So everybody, make sure you got a pencil handy or a pen and paper because we're going to go over this in enough detail that you'll understand exactly what wholesaling is. Okay, everybody, so far so good. Can I get a quick shout out here? Um, you guys are on board, okay? Everybody has water. You've shut the door. You're not going to get up and turn on the TV, and um, you're not going to answer your phone. <laughs> and I know if you have small children, that that's a there's an exception there for small children. I realize when they're three years old, they don't understand the concept of a closed door. So I'm okay with three-year-olds, all right? Okay, back to the class. All right, let's get right into the subject, um, wholesaling. Now, wholesaling it is basically selling the contract on a property, okay? So if you look at your module, uh, module three at the end, I'm sorry, module two in your, in your training material. Now, some of you on this call here are brand new and you're not even going to have module two yet. Don't worry about it. I'm going to cover it in enough detail. You'll understand what we're talking about. And when you get to your module two in another week, you, it'll just, you will you'll, it'll be a refresher course for you. Okay. So the bottom line is this, I want you to look at this, uh, little graph I have down here. Um, it shows three, three parties, party A, Party B and Party C. Okay, Party A is, you know, well, let's just go through this. All right, um, the owner of the property is Party A. All right, that's the person who owns a physical piece of real estate, an improved piece of property. Uh, just to say, it's a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house on a quarter-acre lot. That's Party A. All right. Party B is the person making an offer on the property owned by Party A, all right? That's your buyer. That's your buyer, okay? Now, in this case, the buyer really, the Party B really isn't the buyer. Party B ends up being a wholesaler, okay? Um, and we're going to describe what I mean with that here in a second. So Party A gives Party B, uh, or they both come to terms and execute a legally binding contract, basically a sale agreement, a sale. Okay. So far so good. That all should sound very familiar to everybody on the call here because that's your basic uh, diagram of a real estate transaction. However, in the case of wholesaling, party B really is a wholesaler. They do not have any intention of actually owning the property. What they want to do is sell the contract that they have on the property to a third party, party C, who really does want to live in a house, who really does want to buy the house, or maybe they're going to be an investor and flip it. You can you can wholesale rentals, you can wholesale flips, and you can wholesale owner occupied properties. All right. So in other words, what Party B is going to do is is assign the sales agreement to Party C for a fee. It's called an assignment fee or a wholesale fee. So let's say that Party B has uh, the home owned by Party A under contract for a hundred thousand dollars, and they believe that house really is worth about one hundred twenty five thousand. What they can do is sell that $100,000 contract to a third person, Party C, for, say, $20,000. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll earn $20,000 in an assignment fee or a wholesale fee. Party C then takes over the contract and purchases the property for par, from Party A for the original $100,000. Now, Party C did cough up twenty grand to Party B for the, for the privilege, for the right of doing that. It's called, again, a, a wholesale fee or an assignment fee. All right? So, and if you notice, I said 20,000 as opposed to 25, and that's because you want to leave a little, a little on the table for the, for the party who's actually going to buy the property, party C. Make it worth their while, okay? Give it, give them some, some reason to want to jump into the game here and actually buy that contract from you, okay? So, uh, in any case, here's, here's the deal. Um, party A gets, uh, sells the, gets the property under contract for par, party B, sales agreement. Party B wholesales the deal to Party C, all right? At the end of the day, Party A actually sells the property at a closing to Party C, all right? Now, real quick, I've already got some questions here because I know everybody's uh, in certain states are right now sweating because in certain states, um, there are there actually in every state, there are rules around wholesaling. And what I'm going to get to later on here in a few pages, I'm going to describe what you do when you're a licensee who's involved in wholesaling. So right now, I just want to describe the concept 
of wholesaling. In a minute, we're going to go into some rules and some regulations and what you guys need to do to prepare or pr protect yourselves, okay, so that um, you're operating under the law and ethically and morally and every other way, okay? So real quickly, let's check and see what we got so far um, on questions. Okay. Uh, now, Ron, sent, Ron, you sent a uh, message over, but all it says is Gary, comma, and then it, there's nothing more. Let me see if you – oh, here, here you're following up here. This is um, um, Ron Herbrock. Hey, Ron. And let's see. Our RIA group just had an investigator from the Ohio Division of Real Estate come in and said that Party B absolutely must close on the deal in order to stay legal. So here's what's happening, Ron. This, and this is um, – now, this is just the way Ohio interprets the, the rules, and I've seen this done in other states too. So what happens in these situations, Ron, is you actually do – you go to a closing, okay? And, and the reason they're doing this, by the way, is you're going to guess it's all about the money. That state, the state of Ohio, wants to collect a transfer tax on the transfer of the property from Party A to Party B. And then again, from Party B to Party C, okay? That's why they're doing it. They're, they're collecting the uh, the transfer tax. So, Ron, here's what people are doing. These are legitimate attorneys in nearly every state in the in the country who are doing this. What they're doing is they're bringing both uh, all the parties uh, to the closing table, okay? And what happens is the attorney will the, – the both parties A and B agree to mark their original contract null and void. And then parties B and C agree to their to their surviving contract. Okay, all legal. Um, I know that people will would try to fight that because it's just a matter of time before they do. But that's that's the legal way to do it. There's no reason why two sane, mature, uh, law-abiding citizens cannot uh, um, uh, mark void at a, at a contract at any time during a transaction as long as they both agree. Okay. Um, so in any case, that's what I've seen being done, and I've, I've seen it done um, personally in at least three different states. Hang on one second here. Let me go back um, and see. I want to make sure. Okay. They were saying that Party B must be a principal. That's true. If they were to stay involved with that transaction as a wholesaler, what they're saying is, well, you can't be a wholesaler. You actually have to take ownership, take title, pay the transfer tax, and then transfer title again. That's what the state's saying, okay? Okay. Um, so what, what these attorneys are saying is, hey, we're going to follow the law. We're just going to avoid the original contract, and then at the closing table, Party A is going to sell directly to Party C, right? That's what they're doing with a, with a brand-new contract. Um, you know, there's a lot more to that behind the scenes, but essentially, Ron, that's what they're doing, right? Let's see. LJ says, any pitfalls for real estate – for a real estate who wants to wholesale a property. So, so LJ, it didn't come through, but I think you meant to say, are, are there any pitfalls for a real estate agent who wants to wholesale a property? And the answer is yes, and we're going to go over that here in a minute. Uh, okay, let's see. Pat Callahan says, why would a buyer go through a middleman to buy a property? What's the advantage to the seller? Okay, so here, here's uh, let's let's get into that next, Pat. I'm going to describe to you next why this works and how this works. Okay, so let's move on to the material, which is um, why it works. Okay, um, basically, actually, I've got a little bit of description of it up here. You have three parties here. In the in the case of in, investing, wholesaling is a popular strategy. And now I will tell you this. I'll, actually, I'll save my comments to the end. I don't want to. I don't want to sway your guys' opinion on wholesaling because I'm actually required to teach it. <laughs> Um, but I have my own personal feelings on wholesaling I'll share with you later after I've gone through the curriculum. But the reason it works well is um, you have typically a seller, party A, who owns a property. They may be distressed. They may not. They just simply may may want to sell the property, um, and they only want a certain amount of money. They might say, you know what, I, I just want – I don't know if I described this up here or not. I don't think I do. I describe it later on. They just may want – hundred thousand dollars for the property. Okay, you as a realtor, if you believe, take one second. Let's get ready to sneeze. All right. If um, <coughs> excuse me, guys. If you believe the property would fetch more, um, then if you're and you're acting as a wholesaler, at this in this point right here, I'm describing you as a wholesaler, not as a agent. Okay, and you believe the property could be worth a lot more, like say twenty percent more, then tell the seller, say, look. 
um, I want to get your property under contract. I'm going to get your $100,000. Would If you agree to give me 30 days to come up with the money, A, and or B, find a partner or an investor who would like to take this over for me, would you agree to that? If I can do that in 30 days and I can get you your $100,000, would you do this deal? And believe it or not, there are a lot of people who say yes. And that's why this business is, is thrives in the world of wholesaling. It happens in every everywhere across North America. It, it, it doesn't matter where you are. I've seen it done everywhere, okay? Um, now, you have to check uh, with your state rules, and if you're in Canada, check with your province rules, okay? Because I know Ontario is different than, than Quebec. I, I know it for a fact. In fact, I'm in Ontario now, and tomorrow night I'll be landing in Quebec at about 6.15. I'll be in Quebec for five days. <laughs> so, in any case, you have to check with your state rules, okay? Every state is slightly different. But um, but basically what happens here is party A just wants a certain amount of money. They're like, you know, I just want this. If I get this amount of money, I'm happy I walk away, okay? Now, party C, the reason why party C would buy the property is, you know what? They just want a good deal. If you, if you can show them that this is a good deal and they have to pay you for the privilege of introducing this property to them, they'll do it. Typically, this is going to work with um, – Investors, I, I normally would not try to wholesale to an owner-occupant, although I know people who have. But typically, I'm going to wholesale to an investor, and an investor is simply looking at the bottom line. Party C, in this case, would be the investor. They're saying, you know what? If I can buy that house for 120, remodel it for 25 grand, have 150 into it, and sell it for 200, I'll buy it for 120,000. Okay. Um, so the other thing too is, a lot of people in the category of Party C, Pat. They have the money, but they don't have the time. So here's the real why behind the, the why this thing works so well. Party B, the wholesaler, is the person with the time. They've got time, they've got skills, and they don't have any money. They want money. Party C doesn't have the time. They might not even have any skills, but they surely have money. So they're willing to, to, to uh, part with some of their money and pay somebody with the time and the skills to find them these good deals, okay? That's the why it works. That's a very good question, and uh, so I'm glad you brought that up because it was a very next subject in tonight's curriculum. <laughs> so, all right, let me check here real quick, guys, um, and see what is the advantage of the seller. Okay, we talked about that. Okay, and Susan says, is this like a net listing? And guess what we're going to cover after this? We're going to cover net listings. So hang on to your hats, guys. We're going to go over a net listing which is what you can do in some states, not all the states, is a licensee, you can actually do a net listing in some states and some in some uh, provinces, okay? Um, now, I haven't taught this out in British Columbia, all right? So I can't tell you for a fact this will work out there. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure right now about Quebec. I've got to check out Quebec because I can't remember. But in any case, uh, in every state in the United States, you have to check with your state because I'll give you an example. Uh, Susan, in, in Virginia, you, you can't do a net listing. The state uh, board of realtors does not allow it. If you guys are in Pennsylvania, and some of you are on the call here on Pennsylvania, guess what? You can do a net listing. It's legal in Pennsylvania. All right. So the quick the quick way to check is um, everybody tomorrow log into your, your state board and post up in the question box, pose the question, um, net listings, and just type in net listings, and you'll see their stance on net listings, okay? So let's assume, I mean, let, let me check it real quick for other, other uh, uh, God bless. Dwayne says, God bless. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Matt says, not in my state. Um, you're right, that's, Matt just, can t just said what I said. You, can, you cannot do it in Virginia, all right? Um, okay, this is from Peter. Hi, Peter. Uh, Gary, so for wholesaling, you are finding the properties for Party C, um, but doesn't that go against your teaching of, in having the investor do all the work? Yeah. So, th so Peter, I'll just go ahead and let the kid out of the bag. Um, I'm teaching this because I'm required to. I don't like wholesaling as a realtor. I don't even really, to be honest with you, I've done it as an investor. But as a realtor, for a couple reasons, Peter, I don't want to go to do all that work. Okay, if I'm going to do all that work, I'm going to buy the property. All right? Reason number one. Reason number two is I feel like I have uh, a moral and ethical obligation to – have my clients benefit from all the equity in the property. If I'm already going to benefit from a commission, I don't feel necessarily good about benefiting also from, from garnishing equity and taking equity out of a property 
um, simply because I had access to information that other people had, or I had the time, or I had the skills. Okay, um, but however, I'm going to teach you what to do here as an agent if you choose to uh, be a wholesaler. I'll show you what to do. All right, um, but but Peter has a good point there. If you're going to go through all that work, you know, why wouldn't you try to figure out how to buy that property yourself? You know, that that's that's number one priority. And for everybody on the webinar here, some of you are already buying your own properties. You know what I'm talking about. You might not be able to buy a property today. But within a matter of a few short months, you're going to be in a position to be able to buy your own property. So if you're doing all that legwork, buy it yourself, you know. Um, in the meantime, though, if you're acting as if using your license as an income producing asset, use it to generate commissions, generate cash flow, and then we have commissions. So um, let's move on here because I'm going to show you here. And here's here's basically a a story, a descriptive example of what I was describing a moment ago. Okay. Um, about the property that somebody only wants $100,000 for, and you think it's worth 120, so you wholesale it and, and get $20,000 in a wholesale fee, and the buyer gets the property for 100, the original seller gets his 100, everybody's happy, okay? And if you're a licensee, yes, you can you can be involved in wholesaling as a licensee and and gain a commission from it. You you actually will be a, a fourth party, the party of the licensee. So you got party A seller, party B wholesaler, and party C buyer, and I know Kelly O'Keefe, by the way, for, for you guys, um, uh, look out for the interview from Kelly O'Keefe coming out here in, in October, just in a few weeks, and she does this up in, up in Massachusetts, so what she does is she learned how to work with wholesalers as a licensee where she's not cut out of the transaction. She's actually figured out a way to get commissions at least three different ways and sometimes four different ways. I'll give an example here. Matter of fact, I'm just going to go off the off the grid here for a moment and just explain to you why I'm teaching you wholesaling, okay? And for you to I encourage you to operate as as a licensee in wholesaling, not as a wholesaler yourself, and here's why. She she finds she goes out there and she finds the properties. She she gets a commission from the seller, okay? She doesn't um get a wholesale fee. She's getting a commission from the seller. She gets it in the hands of a wholesaler. She commands a fee from the wholesaler. It's basically a commission because legally that's what it is, but she does it. Uh, it's sort of like a marketing fee. Okay. Um, she, she gets that from the wholesaler and then she goes out and finds the buyer for the wholesaler. She gets a buyer side transaction. So now she's up to three forms of payment. Okay. in wholesaling. And guess what? She can also end up selling the property on the back end if this guy's a flipper. If party C is flipping the home, she's also going to get the listing at the very end of the day when it's done being remodeled, and she'll get a, she'll get a commission again to sell that property to a consumer who's going to live there. And guess what? She can actually get a fifth payment by 30% of the time finding that buyer. So let's go through that again. All right. Uh, party A is a seller. He's got a property he wants to sell. He only wants $100,000 for it. Um, uh, uh, Kelly O'Keefe finds him. He, she gets a commission to sell the property initially. All right. She sells it to a wholesaler who gives her a, a like a, a buyer's fee or a finder's fee. All right. She goes and finds the, the buyer party C who's going to buy it from party B, the wholesaler. She gets a buyer side commission there. He turns around and remodels it and sells it. She gets a listing, so she gets a listing side there. That's fourth payment. And then 30% of the time, she gets the end user buyer who's going to finally actually live in the house, a fifth payment off of one property. So now do you guys see wholesaling in a different light? See, a lot of investors think wholesaling cuts out the agents. Well, that's what you used to think, okay? You've got to be creative. Think outside the box and leverage your license as an income-producing asset in multiple ways, Okay. Find out how you can serve these wholesalers. Find out how you can serve these 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 distressed sellers who are tired of dealing with traditional agents. Okay, um, so Peter, I hope that answers your question, uh, and I just elaborated on that a, a quite a quite a bit. So let's see, Gary. This is from Donald Price. Hi, Donald. Uh, let's see, Gary. As as another wholesaler example, I got a call today from an investor who asked me if I'd be interested in buying a two-family house lot from him he would turn over a permit ready a permit ready lot to me for a fixed fee I'm interested but I'll need more info in this case he's a wholesaler 
Is that about right? So let me go back over the question again, Donald, and uh, let's review this real quick. Okay, Gary, as another, whole, as another wholesale example, I got a call today from an investor who asked me if I'd be interested in buying a two-family house, uh, two-family two family house lot. So assuming it's a lot, vacant lot that's zoned for two, a two-family home, you can buy a lot from him. He would turn over a permit-ready lot to me for a fixed fee. Okay. Now the question is, I don't know. I don't know, uh, Donald, if he actually owns that lot or not. If he owns the lot, he's not a wholesaler. He's just simply a seller. But if he's acting as a middleman, if he just knows of the lot, he knows of the seller, um, and he has it under contract, uh, he can and he can turn over that lot to you to basically sell you the contract to buy the lot. Then that is wholesaling. But just because he can give you a permit. Uh, a lot that's already been permitted for building a two a two family home on it. Um, that doesn't mean he's a wholesaler. He may actually own the lot. Okay, um, and a lot of guys will do that for a fixed fee. It's just it's just another form of commission. It's just a fixed amount as opposed to a percentage. So I don't know if he's a wholesaler or not based on what you're telling me. If he owns the property, he's not. If he does not own the property, then in this case, he sounds like he'd be a wholesaler. All right. Now let me look for one more question here. I'm going to get into some some legalities here in a minute. Let's see. Okay, are home appraisers involved in this process? Wouldn't they determine the true value of the home? It wouldn't person A want that information prior to selling. Also, would you would you want to already have person C ready to go prior to purchasing a property? Uh, and and actually, let's see, that is from um, Matthew. We're actually going to cover that next. The fact that you yes, you have to have your buyers first. Okay. Um, you said to ask for 30 days, so I was trying to understand how that works. So the first part of your question is um, the appraiser would get involved when Party C, if Party C is buying it with a loan, then an appraiser would get involved with that transaction, okay? But in the beginning part, you know, the wholesaler is just basically getting the thing their contract. He doesn't care what an appraiser thinks. The wholesaler is probably savvy enough or should be savvy enough to know what he believes that property is worth, okay? So no appraiser is involved until we get involved a lender and that's typically going to be either party C who's an investor or if they're not if they're paying cash and they're remodeling it to flip it then the other party the end user buyer who's going to buy and live in it yes they will probably get an appraiser but the appraiser it doesn't care he's not going to know that the thing was wholesale all he knows is party C or in the case of a flip the end user party um, is buying it and buying it with a loan and that's all he knows about that's all he cares about he doesn't he doesn't care about wholesaling he doesn't want to know about it either um, so we're going to talk about uh, the proper flow of events when you're wholesaling guys here in a minute. So Matthew, that was a good question. Um, let's see, this is Jenna. Uh, hi, Jenna. Jenna says, so which client do you want to make sure you touch bases with first, seller or buyer? So let's go ahead and talk about that then, guys. Um, remember, there's party A, party B, and party C. Let's assume... You are now party B. You guys on the webinar here, you're party B, all right? What you want to do is before you ever, ever, ever go find a property to get under contract that you intend to sell the contract on, never, ever do that unless you've got a list of ready-made buyers that you've already pre-qualified, okay? Um, that is the number one mistake I see people go through in wholesaling. In fact, let me get back to the material here because we cover that. Um, Let's see, where do I cover that? Um, matter of fact, look at that right there. Uh, the latter approach is, not, is necessary for an estate like Virginia that does not allow net listing. So we cover this in the material. Make sure you guys um, go over the material, reread it, re-listen to it because we go over this, and it's very important that you that you do that. Um, okay, let's see. One agent on our team gets a listing. He okay. Uh, I'm going to try to skip down and find the, the subject I want to cover next here, which is uh, the flow of events. Um, okay, wholesaling business structure. Actually, let's do this, guys. Let's talk about net listing, and then I'll get into the uh, the flow of events, what you do when you're wholesaling. So let me – I'm going to depart for my, my uh, statement a few moments ago. We're going to talk about net listings first. So let's say you're in a state that allows net listings, okay? What that means is you as a licensee – can now approach, you're now party B, all right? You're party B and you're a licensee and you're gonna approach party A to get the property under contract, but what you're gonna, when you ask them questions, when you, when you determine their needs and wants, 
And that party A says, you know what, all I need is $100,000. All I want is $100,000. I don't care about anything else. I just want to sell this house for $100,000. I'm not going to paint it. I'm not going to clean it. I just want to sell the house for $100,000. And you as the agent feel fairly confident that that house is really worth about one hundred and twenty-five dollars in its current condition. You know you could sell it for one twenty-five. dollars So what you say is you say, you know what, Mr. Seller, I'm willing to take some risk here. I will, I will take the listing here. Um, I will put in the listing contract that I will, I will market your house and sell it, and you will get $100,000. However, I'm going to market it for $125,000. And if I get any, any amount over $100,000 in the sales price, I'm going to keep that difference as my commission. So you as the agent, if you list that house for 125 and you've agreed contractually to give him 100 and let's say you sell it for 120 you get to keep the $20,000 of your commission. Okay, it's called a net listing. And guess what? Yes, it is legal. Yes, it does work. And, and uh, a lot of states and provinces, okay? Um, again, we gave the two examples. Yes, in Pennsylvania, though in Virginia, those were just happened to be two examples. But the bottom line is this. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, if you're, when you go to sell it, the, the, the listing, let's say you list it for 125, you sell it for 120. Remember, you're typically going to have to give up a 3% commission or some buyer side commission to whoever brought in the buyer. You may get lucky and bring in the buyer, okay, because 30% of the time, statistically, you will. So you get to keep all the goodies for yourself. Now, you're not giving them 3% of your 20000 You're offering them um, uh, 3% of the sales price, okay, 3% of 125, so that's going to be about $4,000. But the bottom line is you're getting 20. They're going to get 4,000, you're going to get 16, okay? You're never, ever, ever going to split that that difference with them just because they brought the buyer. You're going to simply give them a traditional commission, which is exactly what they expect, okay? Um, now, real quick, does everybody understand um, a net listing and, and how that is different than wholesaling? It's basically you're acting as a wholesaler, your licensee acting as a wholesaler, but you're not wholesaling, you're doing a listing, but it's called a net listing, and if you sell it for anything over $100,000, you get to keep anything over $100,000. Now here's where people get into trouble, and I know these questions are coming up. What if it only sells for $100,000? Well, guess what? You don't earn anything. <laughs> if you get an offer for $100,000, you better darn well present that to your seller, because if it's discovered that you didn't, you're you're done. You've lost your license and fines. So you're going to be fined and penalized, all kinds of stuff. So what if what if an offer what if the only offers come in are lower than a hundred thousand dollars? Well, you don't sell the property, okay? So the risk to you is you don't sell it for one hundred twenty. You don't even sell it for one hundred ten. You only sell it for one hundred one or something like that. You might only make a small pittance, but you don't. That's why you don't want to do this unless you're really confident of what that building is really worth, okay? Um, now, here's the problem I have with that. You know, as a licensee, I believe that equity belongs to either the seller or the buyer or some combination thereof, okay? And it's my job to help them negotiate a fair, equitable transaction for the both of them, and I simply get my commission, okay? I'm okay with that role. Uh, Gary Wilson, can, I can go to sleep at night, uh, wake up in the morning, and be happy with who I see in the mirror. I'm not suggesting that it's wrong, okay? It is legal in a lot of places, all right? Um, I just feel like I have an obligation to serve, and that's how I choose to serve. So I went ahead and said it. I let the cat out of the bag, and now you guys know a little bit more about me. You can wholesale if you want to, but here's the deal, guys. I want to go back up here for a second. Actually, let me go down here. Um, LLCs, all right? If you are engaging in wholesaling and you're a licensee, I would write this down and put it in, in big, giant, bold letters and underline it. You need to set up an LLC, okay? If you're engaged in wholesaling, this is this is if you're wholesaling for yourself, okay? Not you're you're not acting as an agent, you're a licensee, but you're involved in wholesaling. So even if you're in a state like Virginia, where they don't allow net listings, yes, as a licensee, you can wholesale. As you can you can play the role of a consumer. Where there's a way you have to do that so that you don't put yourself in a position to um, uh, be scrutinized by the state. And what you do is you set up an LLC. So the LLC becomes party B, okay? 
the LLC makes the, makes the offer on the property owned by Party A. So the sales agreement is going to say Party A, John Doe, Party B, um, Susan Murray, comma, LLC. All right. Now, Susan Murray, who just happens to be a licensee, a real estate licensee, owns the LLC. She owns, um, let's just call it ABC LLC. You know, we can call it Susan Murray LLC too. What I here's here's the difference in what I teach. What I teach is this: is I wouldn't I would tell every agent, including Susan and everybody else, do not do your own transaction paperwork. Do not execute the sales agreement where you're acting as a licensee. You pay another agent in your office a transaction licensee fee. I know most offices have people already on in staff to do that for as little as 200 or as much as 300. So pay them 250. Have them do all the the contract work. Okay. Now you're not acting in the, in the you're not acting in the role as a licensee. You're simply acting as a consumer who happens to own the LLC, who's getting the property under contract. And then Party B, the LLC, would then sell the the the, the contract to some other party or third party C. Okay. So that's way that way Susan, any other agent, remains a um, a arm's length away from the from the um, the actual transaction itself. Okay. You never actually. Uh, get you never take uh, ownership of the property or LLC does and you don't act as a licensee someone else does that's how you protect yourself that's how you protect the clients and that's how you stay compliant and ethical so real quick I just gave you guys a huge huge uh, brain full of information let me check here on questions because um, I want to get into one more piece here and it has to do with uh, what comes first the the chicken or the egg all right um, all right, so far everybody seems to be okay. Can I get a couple of shout outs there? Are you guys okay with what I just described there? Um, let's see, Susan says, don't worry about that question. I think I just scared Susan away from wholesaling. <laughs> hey, Susan, don't, listen, if, if it's something you wanna do, um, you do let me know and I'll walk you through it, okay? We, you always, you have my phone number, you know guys can call me anytime, okay? Um, Susan says, laugh out loud, yes, we'll see. All right, let me get into the, to the second part uh, Ricardo says, thanks for the tip. You're, you're very welcome. I'm, you know, this was something that, um, I actually went to the state. I went to multiple state boards of realtors to get these answers. That's where I got these, these answers from. Okay. And I, I did it myself and yes, they do work. Okay. So essentially guys, what you're doing here is you're selling the contract. You're selling the contract, not the property. That's what you're doing in wholesaling. All right. Now the biggest problem I see with people, um, in wholesaling is they do a pretty shabby job. They, they have a, kind of a crappy presentation. So I like the famous classic quote from Bill Cosby. He says, you know what? If you give me a prime rib on a trash can lid, I don't care how good the meat is, I'm not gonna like it. But if you give me a prime rib dinner on a set of nice china with silverware and crystal, I'm gonna love it, okay? Um, same thing with wholesaling. Where a lot of wholesalers fall short is, they just are simply out there working their butts off, pushing paper around, but they don't have any, they don't actually shine it up and and, and make it look good. Uh, now I don't necessarily mean the, you don't have to go in and clean the property, but take nice pictures of the property. And by golly, build yourself a website. So this is a, this is a big hint for you guys who want to wholesale. Build a separate website for your wholesaling. Display properties on there with very nice pictures and financials. Sh show people why this is a good deal, why they should buy that property and, and, uh, and give you a wholesale fee, okay? So always build a uh, build a good website and, and put a good portfolio of properties on there. Now, before you ever, ever, ever do that, look at this paragraph right here. Building your database of buyers, okay? You always, this is what Susan was asking a moment ago. When you're wholesaling, most wholesalers I knew who, who I see are actually failing. And what they're doing is they're going to find the properties first, okay? Because that's what their intuition is telling them to do. And then they go to find the buyers. Well, guess what? It's That's not the right way to do it. It's actually backwards because here's what happens. Wholesaling timelines are typically very quick, like 30 days, okay? Your, your, your seller is taking on some a little bit of a risk here, okay? He only wants $100,000. Um, but the reality is, is you're, you're if, with the exception of net listing, straight wholesaling is you're keeping his property off the market, okay? Remember, it's not getting listed in traditional wholesaling. You're going out there yourself and trying to find a small pool of buyers who might be interested. 
So that's why you get a, a short period of time to get it under contract or to sell the contract, all right? So what you do is you go find your buyers first, okay? And the best thing you can do is use traditional methodologies like workshops, like, like uh, education or classroom platforms, like the booklet that I teach people to use. Get your buyers first. Get them into the first flip. Get them into the second flip. Get them into the first rental property. Get them hungry. Get them excited because they see it working. Now you can go out there and find wholesale deals, deals and do what Kelly O'Keefe does. Kelly O'Keefe, she never buys an investor property herself ever. She's been doing this for 10 years, guys, and she learned how to work with wholesalers, okay? Um, buyers, sellers, and wholesalers, parties A, B, and C, and she gets paid every time she turns around. Um, so think of it that way. Get your buyers first, okay? Then go out there when you approach the sellers, you can then get involved in wholesaling as long as you do it the way we teach it. You can do it legally and ethically in every other way. Um, if you don't want to wholesale yourself and you just want to get the commissions, then find a wholesaler who's interested and tell them you're going to, you're going to give them not only the potential property, you're going to also give them potential buyer. What wholesaler wouldn't want that? Okay. And by the way, when they get their wholesale fee, you don't just get a simple 6% off of that. You tell them you want, you want a, you know, a, a marketing fee, finder fee, whatever you want to try to call it. Okay. There's a number of ways to go about it. Um, the bottom line is this. Always get your buyers first when you're wholesaling. Always. No exceptions. Now, when you have these hungry, ready buyers with money and lines of credit available to, to jump and take action, when you go to find those properties, that 30-day window of opportunity is not going to be a problem for you. Matter of fact, you'll kind of become a hero in the marketplace when it comes to um, that type of business, all right? Um, okay, so did I... Uh, did I answer your question as far as what comes first, the cart or the horse? Let me see. We've got a question here from Matthew. Okay, Matthew says, okay, uh, will wholesaling continue to stay as a 30-day process even with the new HUD-1 and disclosure documents going into effect as of October 3rd? Uh, we are being told to look at a 40-day closing timeline. Well, that's Matthew, that, that's actually for traditional transactions. Um, with this one here, you know, Essentially, what you're doing is you're you're not actually going to go to a um you're not actually going to execute a, a HUD one in the case of Part A to Part B, in the states where they you can still do Part A, Part B, Part C, you're 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 what you're going to do is you're actually going to assign the contract. Okay, you're assigning the contract, and Part C is going to closing um, to buy from Part A. And yes, they will get 45 days. But on the front end, on the wholesale end, where you're getting it originally on a contract, where the wholesaler is getting the original property under a contract, that's a 30-day wholesale window. That's really not a closing window. That's a wholesale window, a window by which time that wholesaler party B should actually sell the contract. Okay. Now, let's say you're in a state where they're like Ohio, where they're cracking down. They're saying, hey, we want that transfer tax. We don't want party B to um, just to sign the contract and not pay any transfer tax on it. Yes, you have to pay income tax. But transfer tax, uh, they want to collect that too. So what in those states are doing is, um, to remember, they're, they're marking the original contract null and void, and they're writing a new contract between Party A and Party C. That's what the that's what the closing attorneys are doing. So that that what you just asked about, Matthew, still doesn't even apply in those situations. So the only time it applies is when Party C actually closes on the property, and then the answer to your question is yes. That 45-day window would be in play then. Okay, excellent. Man, these guys, you guys are <laughs> out for it. Also, some great, uh, asking some great questions tonight, guys. I really appreciate it. Okay, Matthew says, got it. Makes total sense. You're well, very welcome. Thank you very much. This is for from Victoria. Hi, Victoria. So, Victoria, join us tonight, guys. Um, it's a, kind of a special, uh, special, we'll just call it a special evening. Okay, Victoria says, how do you think the expected shift in the market will affect the investment wholesale transactions? Um, here, here, guys, uh, here's uh, – Victoria's asking a good question because she just saw me teach a class in Reston on – Reston, Virginia this past Thursday. In fact, along with uh, Joe and Matt and Betsy, um, and they, they they heard right for me how I feel about the future in the market. Um, I'm a very optimistic, positive person, and when I was told earlier in this year to get out there and get this program out, to the agents, they, it was because the, they felt like we're heading into another economic dip in 2016. Now, I don't really care what the economy does, guys, because I, I know how to make money, whether it's 
good economy, bad economy, a recession, depression, I don't care. Once you learn what I've learned, you're going to be able to, you'll know how to make money. That's not going to matter. You're not going to care what the weather does, what the season is. Um, and real true investors also know this. They never let the economy dictate when they do or don't invest. Sometimes the methodologies and the strategies will change. So back to Victoria's question here. I don't see the investor business really changing that much. Um, I do see wholesaling picking up a little bit, okay? Um, you know, wholesaling typically does – wholesalers do better in, when there's more inventory, okay? In a tight inventory market, you're not going to see as many people wholesaling successfully because it's tight inventory, you know? Um, sellers are not they're, – they're not uh, – they're not uneducated, stupid people. They're, you know, for the most part, I've found my consumers are very much in touch. They're very intuitive. They can tell when somebody's being authentic and genuine, and they'll ask a question. Hey, you know, I, I get the idea that there's just, uh, you know, a lot of you guys are having a hard time getting commissions. There's not a lot of sales going on. You know, what do you think I can really get from our property? I really only want or need $100,000, but can you get more? So I, right now, for the last year or two, you know, wholesaling has been occurring in certain marketplaces around the country, like in the Carolinas. Wholesaling is still real big in North and South Carolina, of course, in Georgia, uh, still parts of Florida, parts of Utah. Um, let's see, where else have I seen it? Illinois, Indiana, certainly Ohio. Um, and uh, did I say Indiana? Yes, Indiana. Okay. Um, and not so much in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has did a good job of churning through their inventory, you know, um, and definitely not so much in Virginia. OK, so uh, I'm not sure about Massachusetts, though. I, I don't think wholesaling has been a big deal in Massachusetts for quite a while now because they've definitely got tight inventory. But in any case, so Victoria, back to your question, um, as, as, the, as the market changes, now we just saw the stock market have a 10 percent correction. All right. What that means is. We know within six months, the rest of the economy is going to follow suit. They, they, again, the stock market is always a, about a six-month predictor of what's coming down the line. Well, that's why the, this past winter, everybody was telling me, get this program out there. We want our agents to have this in place so that they can, they can develop another stream of income before, before things turn. Um, that's why I'm out here doing this, because they predicted that. I, I didn't predict it. I just was following instructions. Um, however, I'm a believer now. I do believe, yes, we're headed into, a, into another dip. Um, I don't know. I can't tell you how broad, how deep, how wide, how long, or anything. Um, I do know that uh, it, and up in parts of Canada, particularly in Ontario, because I'm here now, I know what's going on. We're already three months into a correction up here, all right? Um, and our borders are not that solid when it comes to, to economic factors. Um, we're very much, we very much play off each other between the, between the states and, and Canada. Um, but in any case, what I see happening here is I'll, I'm, I'm going to predict that the residential business is going to drop off just like it always does in an economic dip. You know, people who have homes and they're comfortable and they, they might want a bigger home, they're going to simply pull off on the sidelines. They're not going to sell because they don't have to. They might want that bigger house, but they're also more mature. Uh, they're more not just mature age-wise, but they're more mature with their money. They've been through a recession. They know that it doesn't make sense to sell in a down economy just because they want a bigger house. So you're going to see a, a dramatic um, a decrease. In fact, the Victoria, I'll give you a, a big um, hint here. In the last recession, the the affluent market actually reacted later on during the recession. They did not react right away in the beginning of the recession. It wasn't until about two years in before the affluent market decided to stop. And it didn't just drop 25%. Across the board, volume dropped 25%, okay? Transaction volume dropped 25%. In the affluent market, it actually dropped 75%. That is dramatic, okay? Now you know why we're teaching this program, okay? We want you guys to be out there working with investors and, and getting, you know, think of, think of the, your investor business as your backbone. It's the steady eddy. It's you're, you're able to pay your bills, go on vacations, buy houses and cars, make your own investments. Okay. And think of the residential community as your icing on the cake. Okay. That's your cream puff stuff. Um, make the investing business your backbone because we don't just want you to invest yourselves. We know you're going to have steady commissions coming in. Um, so I think we're going to see another dip in the, in the residential sales. So what happened last time, Victoria, it wasn't the, the investor business picked up dramatically. In fact, it really didn't. It was, uh, it was statistically 
it was considered marginal. It was maybe three to four percent of pickup in investor business during the last recession. The reason why it looks so like it looked like it was so much of the business is because the residential side dropped so much. The average again was 25 percent drop. I mean, that's why it looked like the investor business picked up so much. It really didn't pick up. It just stayed steady. And as in a, on a volume basis, it ended up making up more of the business because the residential dropped so much. So you're going to see a drop in residential. You're going to see probably an increase in some wholesaling. Um, and more importantly, you're going to see a continued, a continual rise in rents and you're going to see, you're going to see rental properties continue to go up in price. Uh, in fact, we're still in from the last recession. We've got another six to eight years to go. Uh, where if you're not in the rent, if you're not in the rental business now, it, you better get in now. It's the time to get in now. We think we got another six to eight years to go uh, for a thriving rental business, not just the sales part of it, but the increased increased rent. So, so get involved with people buying rentals, get your commissions, buy a few properties yourself, all for property management because you're getting 10% off your off your rental fees plus a leasing fee. You know that's why you that's why you guys should take this seriously. Use your license, get commissions, to help people buy rentals, and then help to manage them because no matter what you do for the next six to eight years, you're going to have a steady stream of income coming in. Okay. I hope I didn't go off too much of a tangent there. I hope I answered your question, uh, Victoria. Um, Victoria says hi. <laughs> okay. This is a uh, Jenna. Hi, Jenna. Uh, with having a list of buyers in my database, can I, as an agent, just list a property for the seller? and then bring the buyer without having to become party B in the transaction, or does the main benefit as the agent come down to commissions? So Jenna, you just, that's exactly what I would do. So I, I'm not a big fan of wholesaling. I want my consumers to get the equity, not me. I want the commissions. I want the reputation as, of being the, the honorable ethical guy who's helping my investors build wealth and income. And so far I've got a pretty solid reputation and I don't want to change that. Okay. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Well, having a list of buyers. Yes. Yeah, so I would, I would, if you, if you have, uh, if, if you have buyers, Jenna, go out there and find the types of properties your buyers want and use that letter I gave you and, and convince those people say, look, inventory is tight. Let me, let me sell your property. Let me list it. I not only know that I can find the buyers, but more importantly, I'm going to put it on the MLS system for all the other thousands of agents. We'll go buying other buyers and we'll drive, we'll create a, a an auction mentality. Uh, where you have multiple offers and drive your price up, drive your the purchase price of your property up. Jenna, that's what you should be doing. That's my suggestion, okay? Let's see, this is Ron. Ron says, I feel like the banks are sitting on a lot of inventory. Is it possible to wholesale from them before they list these properties? Um, Ron, I've never, I, I don't know that a bank would ever agree to wholesaling. I've never tried it, but you are right. The banks are sitting on a lot of inventory. Um, I did a study down in, um, uh, an area of Virginia called uh, the Peninsula. It's it's Newport News, it's Hampton, um, and part of York. So think of where NASA, Langley Air Force Base is. That's where that is down there. They're right on the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, they had, let me see if I can remember the, the numbers here. It was a startling number of of a short, what, the, what, what pre foreclosure or short sale properties. And all that is is that's 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 a built up pent up inventory that technically should be foreclosed on. The reason, Ron, they didn't actually uh, pull the trigger on a lot of these is the Obama administration really put pressure on all these banks to not foreclose to try to do uh, pre foreclosure and help these people get out of trouble and sell that they couldn't go through a workout plan, sell it on the open marketplace while they're still living there where the property's still in decent shape. Okay, so the rally is though. That property is sitting there not making income for the bank. So technically, it belongs in the REO category. So you are absolutely right. There is a lot of inventory still out there. And I, my, here's my big fear for next year because I've been through it now a couple of times is we still have parts of the country that still have inventory from the last recession. And if we're headed into another dip and it looks like it's a mathematical certainty, what's going to happen with all the new inventory? Okay, because all these people who went through those workout plans, those plans are now coming due, guys, and that's the trigger. That's the impetus for this next dip. The bigger problem is, is our government, in their infinite lack of wisdom, is, is, is printing money like it's toilet paper. That's the bigger problem. The trigger is going to be all these people who went through their workout plans, and now all of a sudden they've got to, they've got to pony up. Um, and I don't see it happening because I don't think we recovered thoroughly enough and deeply enough 
to be able to do that. That's that's uh, that's my opinion. So in any case, uh, yes, Ron, there's a lot of inventory out there. Absolutely. Um, you can. Here's what I would suggest, Ron. Um, go visit the small local banks. Don't go to the big banks. Go to the small local banks. One branch, three branches, five branches. Check them out first on banktracker.com. You got the link. See how they're doing. See how their portfolio is faring out there. And if you see they've got a high number of foreclosures, by all means, show up. Remember, business casual. Don't wear a suit. Don't do like I did the first time. Wear business casual, khakis and a decent button-up collar shirt. Go in, be humble, be your general, authentic, sincere self. Introduce yourself and say, you know, I, I understand you, you may have some, some properties sitting on the fence, and I have buyers who like to buy some of these properties. Would you be interested in let me take one of those properties to, to sell it? If I do a good job, um, no harm, no foul, no obligation, um, would you agree to do a war versus with me and see what kind of answers you get? You might get – I got 50% of my answers were no, but the other 50% were yes, okay? Um, okay, Victoria says, thank you. You're welcome, Victoria. Uh, let's see. Matthew says, I can't hear your audio. Uh, let me – hey, guys, hang on one second. Let me check audio. Okay, audio is working. So – could I get a quick response from somebody? Let me know that you can hear my audio because it looks like it's working. Um, in the meantime, Lou's got a question. Lou says, I showed a bank-owned property, and it was an auction. You had to go to hubzoo.com to place your bid. There are hidden fees and unknown unpaid taxes, liens, et cetera. What are your thoughts on auctions? I don't like auctions. Um, auction houses started popping up a few years ago because they told the banks that they'll sell their properties for 2% or some crazy thing like that. Um, now, that's not the same auction, Lou. That's not the same type of auction as if you're going to the courthouse. That, that's a sales auction. So when you're, if you have a client who buys a property through an online auction like Hubzoo, they are still going to go through their traditional closing process where they're getting a title policy. Never, ever let your clients buy a property without doing a property a title inspection and buying proper or t a title insurance, okay? Um, let's see. Okay, audio is good. Okay, thanks. Good. All right. Uh, Jenna says, I hear you. All right. This, uh, that was five minutes ago. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay, let's see. Everybody seems to be okay on audio. Um, hang on one second. Let me get to the next question. Okay, what was the website? for finding REOs again. Okay, it's a banktracker.com. Now, the link is a lot longer than that, Donald, so look in your original material. I think it came out of Module 1. Um, also, when you went to the free class at the Market Center, that day or the very next day, you got an email. It says it was for me, but it really was from Beverly, and it had all of those links in there. So banktracker.com, if you type it in, you'll get a bunch of marketing stuff. Look for the link that came out in the post-class email. And it'll have the full link, the full URL, and, and paste that into your into your browser, and then you'll you'll be able to plug in any bank you want in the country and find out how they're doing on their portfolios. Okay, hey guys, let me do this. Um, I want to get into how you do this now. I, I'm going to hold off on lease options here. We'll we'll do that another time. That's a different strategy. I was going to cover that if we got time, but we're actually at 8:09. And what I want to do, guys? Okay, just take a deep breath here. Now assume. You intend to, to teach this in a classroom setting to your consumers, okay? The reason I make this third is because it is more complex. It's really not that complex. If you simply diagram party A, party B, party C, um, your consumers will get it. And by this time, they will have gone through the first class on buying flips, the second class on buying rentals. Now they get this class on wholesaling, okay? It'll make them a lot more sense to them when you go through those classes in that order. That's very important that you go through in that order. Uh, believe me, I, I, I've done it a number, number of times, and that's the magic formula. Do it in that order. Week one, teach them flips. Week two, teach them rentals. Week three, teach them wholesaling. Now, what I want you guys to focus on is this. Um, Week four is when you're out there in the field with your clients. Again, this is the, the, the classroom uh, methodology of building client relationships and, and getting loyalty and lifelong people who keep buying properties from you and, of course, having you sell their properties too. The fourth time is actually out in the field. I used to do a Saturday. I'd start at 9 o'clock in the morning and try to finish up by 1. Sometimes I might have to go till 3. Um, and there's another strategy I'll teach you later on that's actually built on this Saturday. It's, the, it's a, it's a one-day event. We used to call them bus tours. But in this case, everybody's driving on their own. You haven't show up at the first property. 
then you go on a, in a train or a, um, a convoy to each subsequent property. Don't go to more than six properties. I know people who tried this, the bus tour, and go to like 20 properties. That's ridiculous. The human brain is incapable of absorbing and retaining and compiling more than information on more than six properties. Because remember, you're going to have these guys filling out rehab forms on these properties. You're going to have them doing the initial financial analysis on these properties, and it's going to take some time. You're going to need probably half hour at each property at a minimum, all right? Um, and what you do is you want to pick the properties. This is one of those areas, this is for Peter, where I divert from my normal strategy, my normal methodology, and I will hand pick the properties that we're going to go see so I can set up the showings, okay? And I want to make sure that we're, when I'm taking 12 people through, 12 people are going to be, on average, you'll have 12 people coming through this class program for you. Um, I'm only going to be showing them the best six properties. I might do six rentals. I might do three rentals and three flips. I might do six flips. You know, it just depends on the makeup of the class. If most people want to flip, I'll show them more flips. If most people want to, most people want to buy rentals, I'll show more rentals. Yes, you can break it up and do it in two weekends. Rentals on this weekend, flips on the next weekend. You can do that too. Um, but here's one of the most beautiful, magical things. If you've done a good job, okay, and they practice, they've, you've given them the forms, you let them do the practice and let them do the homework, all right? Um, they're going to be filling out the forms at the properties, not you. They're going to be filling out the forms. If they can, if they're, if they see that these really are good deals, Guess what they're going to do at the end of the day? They're going to make offers on those properties. You better believe it. And you got 12 people looking at six properties. Don't be surprised if you sell six properties. I, I don't think I've ever had a day where I didn't sell three properties. That, that's three to number three, okay? That's why I like this technique so much. Even for people who don't buy properties that day, now they've gone through your class, okay? They're clients of yours. They're going to only work with you, and you set up showings. Give them the listings. Give them the tools. Let them do the analysis and show them properties over the next week and the following Saturday if you want. I, you, you, you could literally make a living off of this one strategy alone. So that's why I wanted to teach you this strategy, and that's why I spent three weeks teaching it because it's that valuable. It's that important. Um, so if you guys could remind me uh, next week, which will be um, October – the 8th Thursday night, I will be in the Grand Canyon. After spending a full day hiking the canyon and sitting in a pool, I'm going to do a webinar with you guys. So we're going to go over um, lease options, okay? Part one. Part two is we're going to go over um, the bus tour strategy, okay? Now, again, these are, these are uh, advanced techniques. However, when you see how they operate, they're really not advanced as far as complexity. They're advanced in that I want you to already have clients first. That's why I teach you always do, do your own workshops first, do the booklets, do things like that, build up your client base. And then when you go to do things like bus tours, you're, now you're in, you're in the, the, the second tier of profitability. You've got it just, uh, just amazing the, you know, what this will do to ramp up your business. So, so I've just wrote the note down there. Remind me next week. That's what we'll cover. And what I want to do is check here real quick for questions. I know we're dragging on. It's 8.15, but I don't want to leave as long as you guys are asking questions. So uh, let's see. This is from Betsy. Hi, Betsy. You said that we would be getting a copy of the book to send to potential investors. When will that be? So you should have gotten, uh, Betsy, in your first module, uh, that delivery, you should have gotten a copy of that booklet, with that one I went over in the class, in the, in the Keller Williams class that booklet that had the cover page with the picture, uh, the listings in there. You get the actual original format in Word. And so check your, you should have gotten a link from Beverly to go to the website to get your material. And in there, you should have that, that booklet. So check that out thoroughly. Make sure it's in there. Um, we so far have not had a problem with that. So it's, everybody's been getting it. So it's in there somewhere. Um, and I would use that first. You're, you have the right idea. Use that first. And do your workshops first, and then then worry about doing this classroom scenario and bus tours later. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's see. Susan says, "Am I talking to Betsy and Matt Ferguson from Lynchburg?" No, Susan. They're actually from Reston, Reston, Virginia. Okay. Okay, guys. Uh, welcome aboard for you new folks. We had a couple of uh, guest visitors tonight, and uh, welcome to you guys for being here. I hope that you enjoyed. Uh, the webinar and you got a lot out of it and you liked what you saw and heard um, you know we're uh, we're pleased to have you on board we're, we're welcome we're, we're you're welcome and we're happy to share and hope you guys grow okay um, 
In any case, I think that is it for the night, guys. Any questions, by all means, please let me know. And uh, we'll see you next week. Okay, you guys have a wonderful night.